Hi, Pastor Matt Morton here, lead pastor at Cross Fellowship Church. Uh, before the message begins, I just want to take a moment and say thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, it is our hope and our prayer that by watching this video we uh, and hearing the message that indeed it can help you take one step closer to Jesus today. At the end of the sermon today, you'll hear me offer an invitation to the audience. And the invitation is simply to put your trust and your faith and your hope in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you're listening today or watching online and you have never done that, uh, can I just encourage you to take that step, take the step to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Now maybe you have some questions or you just need to know more about that or even how to do that. At the bottom of the screen, here is a telephone number. That's the church office. Uh, please give that number a call. And if it's during office hours, the, the staff will direct you towards a pastor to help walk you through uh, how do you put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ. And if it's out of office hours, please leave a message and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, again, thank you so much for watching today and blessings. What a song, huh? I requested that early in the week and uh, Lauren so graciously changed the entire schedule to fit that song in. Um, I really feel it has a lot to do with what we're going to go over today. And so I have a question for you guys. Have you ever gone out of your way to help somebody, not knowing that's what you were going to do? Like you feel like maybe you were called to go over this way, and it was for a specific purpose that you didn't know until after the event. So we're going to go over four different stories today um, that are similar to that thought. Um, a divine appointment is what we call it, and most people think the divine appointment was Jesus with the woman at the well, which is true, like they traveled completely out of their way for that one um, encounter, and as soon as it was over, they turned and went back to where they had come from, and that's going to be the same in today's story. And so today we titled the sermon, Faith Be Made Sight. And so what does that look like to you? Has anybody here ever heard of William J. Seymour? Anybody here heard of the Azusa Street Revival? <laughs> All right, well, hopefully I bring you something really cool. Behind me is a picture of William J. Seymour. He was a prominent African-American Pentecostal preacher. Um, he was born to freed slaves, and his parents uh, purchased a farm in Louisiana. And so he grew up on a crop-sharing family, um, and then his dad was called to the Civil War, where his dad unfortunately died. And so he became the man of the family, and he raised the family, and he felt it was their best interest to sell the farm, use the money, and to move. And so they did that, and they moved to Indianapolis trying to get out of the South because of all the racial stuff and the segregation that was going on in the South. And that's totally understandable. But one of the cool things about him was he was invited to Ohio to help start a church. And he went there to preach for a little bit, and he didn't feel comfortable. He thought he was called to something else. And so he wanted to do traveling evangelism. And so he left Ohio, he went to Chicago, then he went south, uh, Louisiana. He ended up in Texas. And somebody in Texas asked him to help start a church, Charles Parnham. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him either. We're not Pentecostal, we're Baptists, so some of these names may be unfamiliar, but there are really cool people in church history. He felt inadequate to lead a church, so he decided to go to California where there was less stuff with uh, you know, race and segregation going on in California. So he went there to go to seminary. And when he arrived in seminary, he asked if he could enroll in seminary, and they told him that unfortunately, because of all the stuff going on in America, they, they wouldn't allow him into seminary. So he asked again. He was very persistent in going to seminary. And he was denied two or three times because of the color of his skin. And so with bold faith, he showed up at seminary anyways, and he sat outside the window of the seminary classes. And if you guys are familiar with Southern California, the LA area, Los Angeles, California. It gets pretty hot. It rained a lot back then. So he sat outside in the elements, and he would yell in questions through the window, and the students and the professors would yell out the answers that he had to his questions. He would write papers, and he would write sermons, and the professor and the students would grade the, the papers and the sermons. Unfortunately, he died without ever getting credited with seminary, but he did the seminary. He sat outside the window, and he did seminary. That's bold. But his reward from the Lord for being so persistent, so bold, was he was the leader of, and the kickoff of the Azusa Street Revival. And what that was, was in 1906, in May of 06, um, you can see up here, that is a, a church building they took over, but it started in a home in Azusa, California. 
or off of Azusa Street in L.A. And it got so successful that thousands were coming to Christ in like a four-year period. And people were traveling out to California just to witness this event that was going on in Azusa Street. And what it was, was it was the beginning of the charismatic movement in Christian history. And so I grew up in the Calvary Chapel churches. We stem from the Foursquare movement, which stems from the Pentecostal movement. So there's a lot of that going on in California. This really cool stuff um, that he was credited for. And if it wasn't for him, if it wasn't for his persistent faith, if it wasn't for his bold faith, and if it wasn't for his blessed faith, they wouldn't have had that movement. I'm sure God would have used somebody else, but it would not have been um, William J. Seymour. And so the, the Azusa Street Revival was a Pentecostal gathering that occurred in L.A., California in April of 06. And most of today's Pentecostal denominations point to the Azusa Street Revival as the catalyst of the worldwide growth of the charismatic movement, as they believe the Holy Spirit was once again poured out in a new Pentecost. And so I kind of look up to this guy. Um, in seminary, I was asked to write a paper about him, and as soon as I started reading his, his life history, where he had come from, everything that he had overcome, I instantly fell in love with him as, as just somebody to look up to. I'm sure we all have somebody we look up to. I look up to also Bob Marley. I don't know if you guys know that name, Bob Marley. Anybody? Um, but I fell in love with Bob Marley, and I probably know way too much about the man, except for people like in his family should know that much. Um, but that's how I feel about uh, William. Um, we share the same name, and so I, I feel that connection. But I fell in love with his story, and I, I ask you if you have the chance, go to YouTube and just search up the Azusa Street Revival and watch. There's some, there's some videos out there. They were supposed to make a movie about him. It has not come to fruition yet, but I'm excited for it. Um, I think he was one of the greatest men in church history, American church history. Um, and one of the things they were trying to stop was he was trying to bring ra racial integration into the church. And a lot of people were upset at the time, so they tried to shut down what was going on. But you know, you can't stop what the Lord is doing. So the Lord was moving anyways, despite what everybody was saying. And so I want you to take away from today's message that even if you think God isn't hearing you or people are telling you, no, you can't do it, be bold and do it anyways. God will provide. God will come through, come, come through for you. And there will be a reward in the end. And so for today's reading, we're going to be in Matthew 15, 21 through 28. And so if you guys turn to Matthew 15 and then stand, we'll read today's, today's reading and then... So Matthew 15, 21 through 28. If you don't have a Bible with you or you don't have an iPad or anything like that, it's up on the screen. And so we begin in verse 21. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word, and his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O oh, woman. Great is your faith, be it done for you as you desire, and her daughter was healed instantly. So you guys could be seated. Um, so let's pray over today's word, Father God. Um, thank you for today, Lord. Thank you for your word. Lord, I ask that you just use me to be able to speak your word. Um, Lord, I ask that your word just, it doesn't come back void, Lord. I ask that it changes each and every one of us in this room today. Lord, I ask that we gain a new perspective on just how important this word is. Um, Lord, and we commit this time to you, and we are so thankful for you. In Jesus' name, amen. And so I want to talk about the story that's being presented here. So last week, Bill was talking about the Pharisees, and they were talking about, you know, um, traditions and stuff like that. We're going to touch on tradition, just like William J. Seymour. We're going to touch on tradition, but we're also going to uh, touch on um, just barriers, and sometimes we feel like there's too many barriers or that, or that we're not being heard. And so last week, they were in Gennesaret, um, 
That's where that story took place last week, was in Gennesaret. And so if you look up on the map, Gennesaret is just right at the top of the Sea of Galilee. And they went all the way to Tyre and Sidon. Now that's a 12 hour walk, and I don't know about you guys, I don't know if I could walk for 12 hours straight. So I'd probably walk for six, and I'd probably sleep for a week, and then I'd walk six more. Um, so it was probably a day, a day and a half journey for them. So this story that took place last week with the Pharisees was in Gennesaret. They left on a 12-hour journey, a 12-hour walk, just to go north up in Tyre and Sidon in the, in the area of Phoenicia to have this one encounter with a woman. And then they turn back around, go all the way back to Gennesaret, and then they cross the Sea of Galilee over to Decapolis, and then um, the very next healing that happens is a blind man. And so that's the story. That's the setting for today. They completely went out of their way to help somebody in need just to go back and walk further to help somebody else in need. So that's why I asked in the beginning, have you ever gone out of your way to help somebody and you didn't know you were going out of your way for that person? And so that's the story here. But let's address the dog in the room or the elephant in the room. Jesus always seems to ask or to make a statement that provo provokes a response. So yes, he did call the woman a dog. And in the Greek, there's two words for dog. There is chiron, which you see up on the screen. And that is like a wild dog. That is something that is purely out for itself. That is something that is a scavenger. Um, one of the definitions I found was mooch pooch, and I thought that was kind of funny. Um, so a dog is a mooch pooch. Also, G Jews called Gentiles dogs on a regular basis because we were considered so unspiritual that even being in our presence could make a person ceremonial unclean. And so for just for Jesus speaking to this woman, he could have been out of temple rites. Like he, if he went back to, to, to Jerusalem, he would not be allowed in the temple until he went through a ceremonial clean, uh, cleaning. That's how important this story is. That's how important it is to us. And so there's also another word, and this is the word that Jesus used. It is kynarion. And what that is, is it's a small dog or it's a pet dog. It is something that is trained or something that lived inside the house. We used to have two dogs. We had a big St. Bernard and a little Yorkie, and it was kind of the funniest scenario, the two dogs. And we would throw them food from the table while we were eating. And when we got our new dogs, Carrie said, we are not feeding them from the table, although we have a few times on occasion, we do throw food from them. Now, I have no kids at home that I took from their plate and threw to them. But that is kind of the story that Jesus is setting here. Um, that would be like him recklessly taking his attention from Israel in violation of his mission. His mission was for the house of Israel first, for the Jewish people, for the Jewish nation. And that would be like taking from them and giving it to, 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 um, to dogs. And the woman replies when she says, yes, right? She says, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. So she's acknowledging the authority. She's acknowledging, yes, I am a dog. And when Jesus called her a dog, I'm sure the, the disciples agreed. They were probably shaking their head in agreement when Jesus said, you're a dog. Because one of them said, um, we can chase her away. We can send her away. That's like if a dog comes running around you while you're on a walk and you're like, shoo, shoo, get away. That's kind of the picture here. Like the disciples were ready to shoo her away like she was a dog. And Jesus used a term of endearment for dog when he was speaking to her. So he still was within tradition of Jewish tradition. She was still a dog, but he used a term of endearment for dog. One that is loved, one that is respected, one that is brought into your home, one that is fed, one that is taken care of. And that's the term that Jesus used. So we're going to get on into the message and get on into to, um, actually breaking this down. And so the first point for today is persistent faith, what that looks like. Because she asked over and over, even though he ignored her, then he called her a dog, and she was still asking for a blessing and Jesus rewarded her for her faith. So the persistent faith. And this one reminds me of the parable of the persistent widow, right? So remember the lady goes before a judge. She wants justice and the judge doesn't want to hear what she has to say. And that story is found in Luke 18. And in verse 4, the judge says, For a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me, uh, beat me down by her continual coming. 
So that is like almost how Jesus felt. This woman was not going to leave until he gave her what she wanted. And that's how we should be in our prayers. That's how we should be in our asking. Even though I pray and God doesn't answer it today, even though I pray tomorrow and he doesn't answer it tomorrow, God will come through in his time and in his way. And if we are persistent in our faith, he will come through and, and, and bless you with that. And so when I was a little kid, my mom loves to tell this story about when I was a little kid, uh, we used to go shopping. And back then you were allowed to like play in the toy aisle while your mom went shopping. And then when she was done, she would come scoop you back up from the toy aisle and you would go check out. And she would say that I would grab a couple toys that I really wanted. A couple I didn't want at all, and then one I really wanted. And I would run up to my mom and I'd be like, Mom, can I get this toy? And she's like, no, go put it back. So I go put it back. So then I'd grab another toy that I didn't want. And I would run up to her and I'd be like, Mom, Mom, can I really get this? Can I get this? And she's like, no, go put it back. So the third toy is the one I really wanted, right? And I would run up to my mom and be like, Mom, can I get this toy? And she's like, whatever, just throw it in the car and let's go. So I learned early being persistent and being bold pays off, right? I don't recommend to any of the, the younger kids in here to do that to your family. Um, Carrie says, I still do it today. She said, I'll run to her with a, with a candy bar and be like, hey, can I get this candy bar? And she's like, no. So then I bring her a TV and I'm like, can I get a TV? And she's like, no. So I'm like, can I buy a new car? And she's like, just do whatever you want. Um, <laughs> So persistent and being bold pays off in a reward. And I know that's a simple, and I see you over there. Um, don't try that at home. So we're going to see a bunch of new cars in the parking lot next week. <laughs> so here's what's cool, though. Even when faced with silence, she still persisted in asking for a miracle. And even when Jesus called her a dog and said he came for his people first, she still asked for something because she knew he would give it to her. That is the kind of faith like we were singing about in the firm foundation. Like, Lord, you have it for me. I know you have it for it. Give it to me. He will give it to you if you're persistent. So this tells us to be persistent in our prayers and do not give up, even when it seems though your prayers are going unheard, because God is listening, and sometimes he's listening for persistence. So imagine the first story I told you, William Seymour. So he goes to seminary, and he says, hey, can I enroll in seminary? And they're like, I'm sorry, because of everything going on in the country right now, we can't allow you here. What would have happened if he would have turned around and went back to Texas? I mean, can you imagine what would have happened? But he persisted. He said, let me in. I'm sorry, we can't let you in. He asked three or four times, please let me in the seminary, and they wouldn't let him in. And I think that's why a lot of us who, who've been to seminary, we, we look on that and we think of it as such an honor to have been able to graduate from seminary when so many before us that have done way more than we could ever imagine, they were denied that very thing. And this leads us to our second point. Bold faith. And Carrie always asks where my water bottle goes, but it goes in my back pocket. Um, the next point is bold faith. When I think of the story Esther, I know I speak of Esther a lot. I really love that book. If, if you guys are not in love with it, I, I suggest you read it over and over until you fall in love with it. I think it's one of the greatest stories in Scripture. But in Esther, think about what happened. Uh, in chapter 4, verse 11, Uncle Mordecai comes to Esther and says, Hey, can you go before the king to save our people? And she's like, I can't. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside his inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter. And if you remember the story before Esther, the first wife, he didn't hold up the scepter to save his first wife. Why would he hold up the scepter to save his second wife? So Esther, right at the very beginning, she, she had no chance at winning this argument with Uncle Mordecai. But Esther went before the king anyways, unsummoned. She went before him, and she had the attitude of, even if I stumble, even if I fail, or even if I die, she's still going to go to save her people. That's that bold faith right there. She was persistent in going, and she was bold in her action. And so I ask you guys today to be bold, and you may say, what does that look like? Step outside your comfort zone. Step outside of something that you normally do. If, if you're, if give, give to the church more than you've ever given 
And that's not just in money, that's in time, that's in serving, that's in other ways. We have so much going on and we could use help. But serve. And you might ask, what does that look like? Well, when I graduated with my bachelor's degree, um, it was the first time I shared my faith with anybody. And it was, it was kind of a scary, scary situation because I knew the lady or the young lady that I was speaking to. She was already off put by Christianity and she didn't want to hear it. And my daughter had brought her friend, and we were sitting down, and she said, I really think it's cool when old people go back to school and finish their degree. And I'm thinking, old? I was only 40 at the time. So that's not old, I don't think. Um, and, I, and she said, well, what did you get a degree in? And I said, I got a degree in theology. So she said, well, I really don't want to hear any of that crap. So I said, okay, cool. I said, can I ask you a series of questions? And she said, Sure. So I said, you know I'm a veteran, right? And she said, yes. I said, you know every November, I start getting text messages, emails, phone calls. I get tagged on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, whatever else. All these different things, people are tagging me and all this stuff saying, go here for breakfast, for a free breakfast. Go here for a free lunch. Go here for a free dinner. And I'm like, that's really cool, but how long does that food last? About three hours, four hours, and then I'm hungry again? I said, or better yet... There used to be a gas station off a of plat. I think it was called Everyday Gas. And for the first 50 veterans on Veterans Day in the morning, they would give a free tank of gas to. So that's really cool, but that lasts, what, about three days, four days? And then they need another tank of gas. And I said, or better yet, I have AT&T. And every year about this time, I get that email from AT&T saying, bring your iPhone in and get the new one. So every year, you could, you could upgrade to the new iPhone. This was before you had to start paying for your phones, but... Back then, you could just trade in the iPhone 3 for the iPhone 4 for the iPhone 5. You could just keep trading in every year without any money. And uh, I said, so that phone lasts, what, about a year before I need a new one? And I said, the gift that I have to tell you about lasts for eternity. And you said you don't want to hear about it? And I think that speaks volumes about how we are in our own lives. If we buy a new car or a new truck, we're quick to run out and tell everybody, hey, go over here, they'll knock some money off if you buy a car. Or, man, have you tried that new restaurant? Their coffee is to die for. Or they got the best steak in town. Or this, this place over here is having a sale on Vans or Levi's or whatever. Like, we are so quick to tell everybody about stuff that doesn't matter. But over here, you're holding on to the greatest gift in the world, and you're not sharing it with anybody. It doesn't wear out. It doesn't expire. And it lasts for eternity. And that's the kind of boldness that's being spoken about in Scripture. And so if we all shared, if we all shared with one person, imagine the impact we could have for the kingdom. As long as we're persistent, as long as we're bold, we will be rewarded. And so Jesus affirms this lady's persistence. Jesus affirms her bold faith and he blesses her by healing her daughter. I mean, can you imagine knowing, right, if knowing, just like William Seymour, knowing what the climate was in the country, could you imagine knowing that those people view you as a dog and yet you still go to them for help? You're still going to them to ask, please let me. This woman knew how Jews looked, looked upon them. She knew it was very bad for them to even speak to her, but yet she still did. She was bold enough to go up and ask for a healing. Think of the Gentiles and all the gods that they had. She didn't go to them, well, that we know of. She didn't go offer all these sacrifices to other gods that we know of, but she went right to Jesus and said, only you can heal my daughter. And so that's where the reward comes in. And so the third point is the blessed faith or the, the rewarded faith. And uh, if you remember the, the hall of faith in Romans and Hebrews, um, in Hebrews 11, 13, um, it says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. So they were living by faith when they died. This is pre-cross, right? So this, Jesus hasn't come yet for them, and yet they still died with faith. And these were people like Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Sarah, Joseph the son of Jacob, Moses, and, and so on, on and on down the line. So many great people that were saved by their faith, right? And all it was was their faith, and that's all that they had. You know, just like right now in our church, we have, um, 
I don't know if everybody knows Karen Pitts, but she is passing away right now as we speak uh, from cancer. She had lost the battle, and she's just living out her final days. She is the, she's one of the most coolest people you ever see. I learned a lot about her over the last couple of weeks. I learned that she had a lot to do with 4K television. She had a lot to do with moving from interlacing um, television to progressive television. Anybody know what I'm talking about? No? She's that smart. So she helped us go from those old rounded TVs to the flat TV with the beautiful picture. You know, the ones actors don't like because we can see all the pits in their face. Um, she was a big proponent on helping to move in that direction for television, moving up to 4K. She is so smart that up at Black Forest, she uses a Greek Bible, like a real Greek Bible. All of it is in Greek, no English anywhere. Um, and as you preach or as you speak, she's reading it in the actual Greek. That's how smart she is. Um, but unfortunately, she's passing away as we speak. Um, just like my brother, last summer he had passed away. Or just like Gary Johnson, one of the pillars of this church right here. They had the rewarded faith. They were persistent. They stayed in their faith. They were bold. They kept pushing their faith, and they were rewarded. Their faith was made sight. The ultimate reward for their faith. They, now they have a perfect body, no more pain and sickness, and to be in heaven with the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we were driving here this morning, and I was talking to Carrie, I was like, what if we have a blessing all wrong? What if we really think, like, Lord can you really give me that 200-inch TV? That would be so awesome, and then I die. Which one would be the better scenario? Me dying and being rewarded with eternal glory with our Lord. And so I, it made me think the rest of the way here, like do we really, when we pray for, for blessings or we pray for all this stuff, is that really what we want? Like it was so hard when... When like my brother died and you say, you, you lay over somebody that you love dearly and you pray for them and you're thinking God is going to heal them, but he doesn't. But his reward became sight. His faith was made sight that day that he had passed. What better blessing is there? What better reward? And so we're, we're God and expressing our total dependence on him and it is through our humility it is through our persistence and boldness that we will receive his blessing in his timing and through his means and what does that look like for us today when is the last time you went like into a dark area where there was no noise and you got on your knees and you actually prayed it's probably been a while bill and i were having that conversation the other day about what does it look like today what does it look like for us and I really thought, man, there's a lot of times I just stand there and pray or I'll be sitting on the couch and I fold over and I pray. But when is the last time I got prostate on my knees and laid out before the Lord, seeking the Lord? It's been a while. And so the other day I got on my knees and I laid there and, and I, I confessed out and I cried out to the Lord. And if that's not bold enough, right, if that's not, if that's not humbling enough, when is the last time that you have confessed your innermost secret? to the Lord? When is the last time you confessed your darkest sin to the Lord? He already knows we've done it. It's not like you're hiding it from it. It's not like he can't see what you've done in secret. When is the last time you have confessed that to the Lord and said, Lord, I have done so and so. Forgive me for it. Draw me near to you. We are learning today through this passage, we are learning today through all of the, the, uh, the stories that I'm telling you that it is the persistence, it is the boldness that, re, that, that receives the payoff. It is the persistence, it's the boldness which in, gives you the reward. And so the last story I want to tell is the story of Jacob wrestling with God, and he was wrestling for a blessing. And this reminds me totally of the persistent, bold strategy of faith with rewards from God. And so in Genesis 32, beginning in verse 22, um, we read, The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. So this was at night. So the wrestle began at night, and we are in coming up on the breaking of day. 
when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but it shall be Israel. So Jacob wrestled with God all night. I don't know how much more persistent that is, but I would have gave up after maybe the first couple seconds. I don't think I could wrestle all night. He wrestled with God all night into the morning where God had to say, the sun is coming up, let me go. That's how long the fight was. And they wrestled all night. That's persistent, bold. How dare you even try to wrestle the Lord, right? Bold, I wouldn't try to wrestle him. Um, I love my hips, I'm sorry. I like walking. I don't want somebody to throw it out so that I couldn't walk. But he was fine with wrestling till he lost his hip. And then he was rewarded. He was rewarded in the morning. The Lord changed his name from Jacob to Israel. I think that's a great blessing. And just to see what Israel's done for the world today, even today, we see the continued blessing of the land of Israel. And so sometimes we have fun in our pastor's meeting. We laugh and joke. We, we like to tell stories and, and, and just laugh, really. And we always say that we are going to ask AI to write a sermon. And I don't think anybody's done it yet. So after I finished my sermon, I was like, this will be pretty fun. Let's uh, ask AI to write a three-point sermon on this very, uh, on Matthew 15, 21 through 28. And this is the three points it gives. And I'm sorry, you can't really see it. So I'll kind of read it to you. But it is pretty funny. Um, This is a computer that can think for itself, I guess. And I just typed in, create a three-point sermon on Matthew 15, 21 through 28. And this is the three points it gave me. It gave me persistence in prayer. Okay, I'm kind of on with that one. Humility and faith. And the power of great faith. I mean, that's pretty good. And I can read each point. um, But it even shows, like when I was discussing this with Carrie, Carrie said, even created things know to bow down before the Lord and give God the glory. And so even in his points, or its points, or they's points, or whatever it goes by, um, (laughs) maybe it just goes by Dell, who knows? (laughs) The Canaanite woman continued to cry out to Jesus, even when faced with silence and rejection from the disciples. This teaches us the importance of being persistent in our prayers, not giving up when it seems like God is not responding God hears our prayers and won't answer in his perfect timing. And the funny thing about that is in the sentence that it, it, it put out, it's a capital G, and any time it refers to God as his or him, it's a capital H. So even the AI knows to capitalize God's references throughout, throughout its answer. Point two is humility and faith. The woman's response to Jesus, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table, demonstrates both humility and faith. Despite being called a dog by Jesus, she shows humility by accepting her lowly position and acknowledging Jesus as Lord, capital J, capital L. Her faith is evident in her belief that even the smallest blessing from Jesus would be enough to meet her needs. Let us learn from her example to approach God with humility and unwavering faith. And the last point was the power of great faith. Jesus commanded the Canaanite woman for her great faith and granted her request for healing. This reveals the power of faith in moving the heart of God and bringing about miracles. Like the woman, let us strive to have faith that perseveres through challenges and obstacles, trusting in the goodness and faithfulness of God. With great faith, we can see mountains move and experience the abundant blessings of the Lord in our lives. And I would say that's not bad for AI, right? He wrote three better points than I did. Maybe I should have waited and asked the AI first and then wrote my points off of that. But I think it's amazing, like, the the times we live in. I think that's pointing to something coming to us here soon. But I think it's pretty powerful that even you ask a computer and it acknowledges that God is God and, you know, every reference to him is in capital because he needs, he, he deserves that glory. And so I just ask that each of us look back at our last week or look at the week coming for us and look at how can we be more persistent in our faith. How can we be more bold in our faith? And then can we be rewarded for our faith? Is there something worthy of of a reward? And that's not necessarily a new car or a new toy. Um, 
maybe it's something just as simple as the Lord speaking to you. If you haven't heard from him in a while, I would be persistent saying, Lord, I'm not letting go until I hear from you. Lord, I'm not letting go until I hear from you. Be bold. Ask for something you've never asked for. Like ask to be, I don't know, a traveling evangelist or ask to be a pastor or ask to be on the worship team or ask the Lord to give you the strength to manage and teach kids. I don't know what that looks like for each and every one of us, but find something that you do like. And I do implore each and every one of you, when you, when you read the Bible, that it's just not a story that, that you're just reading. I hope these people become reality to you. I hope you fall in love with the characters like I do. And seriously, if you do get a chance today, read up on William Seymour or watch a documentary on him. It's, I think he's one of the greatest guys of, of you know, American history. Um, and it's sad that we don't know his name, and yet look at all God has done through him. An entire denomination was changed and moved just through him, just through his faith, his faithful persistence of, can I go to seminary? No, you can't. Can I go to seminary? No, you can't. And then he just sat outside the door. Like, do we have that bold faith? Like when we ask for something and we're told no, will we go sit outside the door? Will we go sit outside? And so I ask each and every one of us to find something like that in your life, something, and you may think that we're all at the church telling you no, push back on us and say, if you tell me no, I'm gonna sit right outside the door until you let me do it um, because it will pay off. I don't know how God chooses or, or why he chooses, but even the very reason that like I'm up here this is a reward I have persistent faith bold faith I think my reward was probably wrong I would have rather have been a millionaire but it's hard to get up and teach God's word you don't want to be wrong you want to be right because I don't want to be punished for eternity for teaching you guys an error and so I just I say for each and every one of us reach in look in and see what you're good at see what your heart is catered towards and pray for that blessing and as the worship team comes up um, so we can go on. Um, I ask you, if you are not a believer in Christ, if you've never put your faith in Christ, find one of us. Be persistent. Call me every day until I answer. Be bold. Show up at my doorstep or show up here at the front and get your reward. Be blessed in your faith for what you've, for, for what you've put your faith into, and that faith is in Christ. Let Christ be your firm foundation.